Hello everyone and welcome to the Population Data Science webinar series. My name is Anne Greenwood and I'm the Education and Training Lead for Population Data BC. Today it's my pleasure to introduce a presentation on Interrupted Time Series and its Application. By way of introduction, Dr. Mohimuddin is a Professor of Biostatistics at the Department of Family and Community Medicine at the University of Toronto. He has cross appointments with the Biostatistics Division of Dalai Lama School of Public Health and the University of Toronto. Dr. Mohimuddin is also a Senior Adjunct Scientist with the Institute of Clinical Evaluative Sciences. He has performed extensive research in biostatistics and primary care research. He has a strong theoretical background in statistics, biostatistics, and methodology, and has collaborated with many senior health sciences research researchers over his career. Dr. Morinui has extensive experience with large administrative databases, specifically those located at the Institute for Clinical Evaluation Sciences and the Canadian Community Health Surveys, which are linked to ICS Health Services data. He has in-depth knowledge of time series analysis, multi-level modeling, analysis of correlated data, randomized and clustered randomized control clinical trials, and was lead biostatistician on several clinical trials research projects. So welcome everyone. Welcome Dr. Muinadin. Thank you so much for presenting today and I'll hand it over to you. Uh, thank you very much for your kind introduction and hi everyone. Um, first of all, there is no conflict of interest like uh, an orion, money, patent, nothing to declare. So, uh, because of the collection of the data routinely these days um, as a kind of sequence of the numbers, then the time series techniques are becoming more and more applicable um, for analyzing, in fact, uh, healthcare data, especially if you're um, using it for the health services research. So, in today's talk, I'll try to introduce some concepts of the time series that are useful, and uh, especially um, by, uh, in fact, introducing a couple of interrupted time series analysis techniques like uh, segmented regression and rational function to show that how time series can be used in order to assess the impact of uh, like intervention, especially uh, after COVID, um, there are quite a large number of studies that they are trying to assess the impact of the COVID uh, on different types of outcomes. And uh, I'll show you how interrupted time series uh, could actually help and answer this question. So what a time series is, is a sequence of order observations. It's extremely important we recognize that the ordering is important and we cannot kind of shuffle the ordering and so on because a lot of information are in the ordering of the data. In time series, generally ordering is through time. However, in some situation, like in spatial kind of statistics, space could be also another uh, kind of dimension for ordering of the data. And uh, the purpose of time series is to see how the data let's say at the system level or the higher level changes over time. And we try to uh, reveal the pattern of the observations over time. Um, there are some similarities and dissimilarities between time series and longitudinal, in fact, data. In classical time series, observations are usually taken on a single entity at a large number of time points. And the measurements are generally 
and quantitative. Although we have binary time series and also we have like count time series and so on. So in the classical framework, time series is a single series of uh, several observations ordered over time. In longitudinal studies, again, generally, observations are made of many entities at few time points. And the observations are generally quantitative or qualitative. So um, this is a classical kind of, in fact, um, design property of the longitudinal analysis that we have several, let's say, patients and we make measurements uh, over a few time points, like two, three, four, or uh, like up to five, six time points. And the techniques that we are using for the analysis of a single time series is different with the one that we use for the analysis of longitudinal data. Although there are some work has been done on the repeated measure time series data, but uh, we are not going to discuss uh, the repeated measure time series analysis. Uh, therefore, when we are talking about the time series, uh, we are talking about one single observation at a given time. Time series has quite a large, uh, in fact, uh, number of branches. So, I mean, the time series is either frequency domain, that's quite popular in engineering, or time domain that statisticians are more interested in. Uh, time series is either univariate time series that we have one single time series, or it's a multivariate time series that at any given time points, more than one, uh, in fact, outcome or one quantity is measured. Uh, time series could be linear time series that we talk about like ARMA model or ARIMA model, or could be nonlinear time series. And the time series data could be normal or non normal. And the classical time series assumes normal distribution that we have time series for the count data, and as I said, for binary data as well. The first step that possibly we can use time series in our research is a descriptive time series. And with the descriptive time series, we are interested to isolate two components. One component is a non-random, or they call it deterministic component. And the other one is the, the random or stochastic component. And uh, the reason is that um, we, we, we try to isolate, uh, in fact, the noise from the true signals in order to be able to see the signals. Uh, there are two generally, again, classical decomposition of a time series, the one that's additive and, the, and multiplicative, if you take the log transformation of multiplicative, we can have an additive. Uh, so a time series can be decomposed into a trend, which is a long moment in the mean, uh, or a seasonal, which is the fluctuation of the series due to the calendar, and then another cycle that that's not the, in fact, the business cycle, but could be, I mean, that is not the seasonal, um, like the, the annual fluctuations, it could be like a business cycle. And the other one is the uh, irregular component, which is a random or non-random systematic fluctuations. There are different statistical methods in order to do these decompositions. I mean that there are, uh, uh, in fact, moving average, uh, regression approaches, and so on, that we can estimate uh, trend seasonality, the cycle, and leave the residuals as, in fact, uh, um, a stochastic component. 
So I want to give one example of application of, in fact, uh, descriptive time series. So in 2002, um, in 2006, the paper is published, but uh, we were interested to see what's the pattern of, uh, in fact, hip and knee surgery in the province of Ontario. And uh, we were interested to see uh, what's the, in fact, the trend and whether that trend is keeping up with the increase of the population and whether there is any seasonality or any fluctuations in the hip and knee surgery in the province. So <clears throat> um, we got the data from uh, 1992 and 2002 um, for the people over the age of 65. And uh, the outcome was the hospitalization rate per 100,000 population that we had. So we estimated the trend and we overlay the population of the province from 1992 to 2001 and compared to see what's, what's the pattern. Well, obviously population increases and we see that the hip and knee surgery also increased. And interestingly, I mean that by 2001, practically it was uh, kind of these two um, are very close, not with respect to the number, I mean that um, the ratio that we can see. Then we looked at the monthly average of uh, number of hip and knee surgeries. So month one is January and month, month 12 is December. Um, so we expect to see that uh, like smaller number of surgeries possibly in January and December that could be due to holidays. But there is another uh, in fact dip that we see in month eight um, which is like August, and that's the um, like the vacation season, and the increase or the highest in uh, in fact October um, and November. So I mean that if you look at this one, obviously nobody expects to see that hip and knee surgery changes by the weather or this sort of things. Therefore, this is not seasonality because of weather and possibly that's driven by the, our, <clears throat> in fact, behavior of, let's say, taking vacations in the summer and so on. So here is the time plot of the surgeries we learn quite a lot from the time plot. We see the fluctuation, kind of uh, systematic fluctuations, and also we see that an increasing over time. So we could isolate the systematic fluctuation on the top and leaving the uh, residuals, uh, which is uh, in fact uh, the random component of the city at the bottom. So that's how we can isolate it. One question that somebody may ask is, uh, okay, instead of just using eyeballing, um, is there any formal test for the seasonality in order to uh, identify uh, if there is a seasonality and also if there is a cycle in order to be able to, in fact, uh, estimate the period or the frequency of that? There are two tests. Uh, one is the Fisher couple, and the other one is Kornogorov Smiranov test. Um, all classical statistical, in fact, softwares like SAS or um, um, State of, they can handle, uh, in fact, performing these tests and giving you the significance and the, and the period of the seasonality if there is in the data. The other thing that we were interested 
was whether really the fluctuation of the outcome is due to only seasonality or something else. Because um, if it's only due to seasonality, it's interesting to know. Uh, so what we did, we introduced um, a measure which we call it, in fact, the <clears throat> R square auto rate. The R square is like the coefficient of determination, which is a measure for the goodness of fit in uh, linear regression. So we adapted that and we used for the time series data. We said that we can use the monthly data and have a dummy variable for the month, and then we can fit a regression model uh, that with the correlated residuals, I'm going to talk about that later, and then quantify the, the R square. And this R square uh, quantifies the magnitude of the, or the, in fact, the power or the contribution of the season uh, in fluctuation of the data. So here for this data set, the R square was um, 0.89 or 89%. Now, uh, as I said, there is a difference between uh, time series data and classical, uh, like random uh, data in the statistics. And uh, therefore, if you want to apply regression uh, analysis or regression technique for the time series, we have to be mindful of some of the conditions that the ordinary least square regression has. One of the conditions of ordinary regression is the independence of the error terms or residuals. And the time series data are generally correlated over time. And if we ignore this assumption, then we are going to have like uh, incorrect estimation for the variance and the in severe occasions, even for um, uh, estimates. So if we violate the independence of the errors assumption, then a statistical test of significant parameters are not correct, as I said. Then the estimate of the coefficients are not efficient and the regression residuals are not independent. That means that the regression, that the residuals, they have some information that we haven't used uh, those information in the model. So one solution to this problem is regression with autocorrelated residuals. So if you look at this equation, uh, yt equal to beta zero plus beta one x one t up to beta p x p t is just a classical regression. That means that y has a linear relationship with these uh, p uh, predictors. But the residuals also follow um, a distribution or a, a model that we call it RMO. So WT is a function of P past values of the W plus uh, Q, in fact, the values of a process, which is like a normal zero and sigma squared. So, here, W is following an ARIMA model um, with the parameters P and uh, with the orders P and Q. And uh, we can fit a regression model um, modeling both the regression part and also modeling the, the residuals together. R and SAS, both of them have uh, procedures and function to do that. I mean that in SAS, Prog Arima allows you to do this kind of modeling. Uh, if there is no moving average, Prog Autoreg also uh, easily handles uh, the correlated residuals and R also has functions for estimating. 
So I very quickly uh, simulated some data from the correlated residuals with the moderate correlations. If I ignore the correlation, then the variance of the residuals would be 2.5, and the T for the significance of the parameter would be 12.45. But if I use the correlated residuals, then you see that the variance of the residuals significantly dropped and the, the test statistics also uh, is different. And when I overlay the residuals using both autocorrelated and uh, uh, ordinary least square, we see that the, the size of the residuals of the autoreg are significantly smaller than the residuals of the ordinary least square. Now I want to turn to interrupted time series. Interrupted time series design is the strongest quasi-experimental approach for evaluating longitudinal effect of intervention. It's a very powerful tool. It can be applied to, uh, I mean, that uh, RCT, observational case control, and so on. So we know that interventions are implemented at either institutional, regional, or national level. I mean that if we change the speed of the highway, or if we, for example, impose the COVID-19 restrictions, either of these are interventions. They could be at the national or at the local level. Now the question is how we can uh, quantify and examine the impact of this intervention on our outcome. That's really what we are interested in. So one approach is segmented regression. I mean that um, like 25 years ago, somebody said, uh, this is a $1 million question that can be answered. And uh, he said that, well, yeah, it's simple. We just use like two sample t-tests before and after, and then we make the comparison. And when I said that, hey, you have to be careful because of, for example, the secular trend, because this process could be going up naturally. And now you are assigning this uh, secular trend to the intervention, then he realized that um, it's not as simple as it looked like. But the segmented regression actually is a very nice framework that allows to model the pattern of the outcome before intervention and then quantifying the change of the outcome um, suddenly, which is practically change in the intercept and also uh, gradually, which is the change in the slope. Therefore, uh, as I just wrote here, uh, in the, in the changes could be immediate or could be over time. It may happen instantly or with some delay it could be transient or it could be long term. I'll show you some of the graphs that shows the difference between the pattern of uh, interventions of this, uh, the outcome change. But what the segmented regression does is fitting a regression model to the data prior to the intervention and a separate regression model to the data after the intervention and make the comparison between these two uh, regression lines. So again, as I said, the segmented regression is appropriate for studying effects of intervention. If it's either randomized control trial, it's natural experiment, or it's observational data. We have done quite a good number of 
uh, this interrupted time series using observational data at ICS for different types of outcomes. Outcomes could be continuous. I mean, that the simple example of continuous could be, for example, uh, continuity of care, or if it's count, it could be like uh, number of ED visits, number of uh, hospitalizations, number of uh, primary care visits, and so on. And uh, this also, these techniques could be applied on the situations that the data are measured at regularly, uh, evenly, in fact, space intervals, and even the non-regular, it can handle it. So in the segmented regression, there are two parameters that we are interested in. One, we call it level. The other one, we call it trend. A level is practically the intercept. Like at time zero, uh, what was the value of the, in fact, the outcome, which would be the intercept, the level. And uh, at the time of intervention, um, what's the value of the outcome? The other one is trend slope or gradient, which is change over time. Therefore, um, when we fit two segmented regressions, one before and one after, we have level for before and level after, then we have trend before and trend after. So the difference between the level before or the level after intervention, it it, it shows the sudden effect, and the difference between the two trends shows the change in the direction of the outcome. So how the models look like? Uh, this framework is very simple. I mean that um, we define two variables or three variables. One variable is time that uh, when we order the observation, it time starts from one, two, three, four, five. I'll show you the data like this one. You have an outcome, call it YT, therefore you make the measurement Y1, Y2 up to Y14 here. Therefore the variable time is one, two, three, four, five, just a sequence of the numbers. Then we have another variable, a dummy variable that we define uh, as to be zero before the intervention and one after intervention. And then the other, in fact, the counter variable, which is time after starts one at the time of intervention and then counts the number of steps or time points. So one, two, three, four, five. So with this data file, we can fit a model um, in this format. So this is the skeleton of the model. Now, what we can do, we can, in fact, also model the error term as an ARIMA model. <clears throat> Therefore, we can take care of the um, covariance structure of the data by modeling the residuals here. If there are some other components like seasonality that uh, the data is seasonal, therefore we can also adjust these um, regression model for the seasonality or other, other factors. Therefore, it's, it's a fairly general, in fact, uh, framework. So the interpretation of these parameters is very simple. Beta zero is the intercept at time zero. Beta one is the slope of the outcome prior to the intervention. Beta two quantifies the change in the level, which is the sudden change. That means that change uh, at the time of intervention in the level of the series. And beta three, which is the coefficient of time after, it, it, it quantifies the difference or the change in the slope of the 
in fact, regressions, because there are two regression lines, one before, one after. Beta 3 quantifies the difference between those two slopes. So if beta 2 is significant, this means that uh, there was uh, a significant level change. And if beta 3 is significant, it uh, shows that um, there was a significant change in the gradient or in the slope of the outcome. Uh, so there is a restriction here that uh, we are assuming that the models are linear. And if the model are nonlinear, we have to use a nonlinear model that I'm going to just introduce one of them in this talk, but other more complex models also is possible to fit to the data. Um, I just want to um, skip this one. I mean, that segmented regression has several, in fact, uh, strengths. And uh, it's, a, it's a powerful statistical tool for assessing the impact of the intervention, especially if some of the conditions um, are hold, like the relationship being linear and uh, also reasonably normally distributed. Otherwise, we have to, to fit a proper model like a count or, or the binary. The first example is uh, coming from the thesis of a PhD students and uh, uh, a published paper that uh, we try to identify the impact of a cancer of the colon cancer care in fact initiatives that was launched in 2008 and the data is coming from ICS so the blue is the pre cancer care check and the red is after um, the segmented regression that are fitted shows an increasing gradient before the 2008 and an increase, a sudden increase, and then a decrease. So that it shows how uh, the pattern of the, in fact, uh, <clears throat> uh, FOBT test changed in the province of Ontario. Um, before and um, after 2008, and the data is quarterly. So that will be about four years data. Now, something I have to mention that people are asking, well, um, whether we should have the same size, how far we have to have before, and how far we have to have after, and so on. If there is a seasonality, you, and the data is monthly, or uh, in fact, quarterly, you need at least like two years before intervention data in order to, to be able to adjust for the impact of the seasonality. And uh, the minimum number of data points, uh, like before or after, if you are fitting a segmented regression is three, because you need at least three data points in order to fit a regression line. Two points gives you perfect fit. And uh, if your uh, data is kind of balanced, that means that uh, the length of the pre-intervention is the same as the length of after intervention, you have the, like, the most power for the data that you have. But generally speaking, uh, if there is no seasonality, like having five points before and five points after should give you a good power in order to assess the impact of the uh, seasonality of the intervention. Another example that I want to show you is uh, another published paper um, that was published in 2013. I mean that the residents of the province of Ontario, uh, they became disqualified uh, from the routine eye exam. And uh, prior to that, everybody was allowed to have an eye exam every two years covered by the government. So uh, the adults who were not low income, they had to pay for the service. 
and uh, we were interested to see what's the impact of that kind of policy change on the routine eye exam because it's important for the diabetic patients. So what we did, we, we looked at the data for the adults age 40 to 64 and also 65 years and older every two years period from 1998 to 2010. And then we use the segmented regression to see the policy change that happened after 2004, how did it affect these uh, impact uh, routine eye exams. Um, I mean that just looking at this plot, it shows that uh, for the male age 65 plus and female age 65 plus, there was no kind of significant change. Um, they were going up and they keep going up, no changes. But if you look at the plots for the male and female age 40 to 65, we see that after 2004, it starts going down and then kind of plateaus. So this is a nonlinear kind, I mean that prior to intervention, uh, possibly we can assume the linear relationship but after intervention, definitely it's not a linear relationship. Therefore, for this kind of uh, interventions, we have to use a rational that I have an example and I'll show you a formula and uh, like a SAS codes that we can assess the impact of the intervention if the impact is kind of nonlinear. So here is just a uh, summary that what was the findings. Now, I show you the type of changes that could happen by the intervention. So the first one is just changing the level. The other one could be a delayed change in the level. Intervention was at time five, but the impact was uh, in fact uh, felt at time seven. So there could be a temporary change in the level. So there is a change goes up for some times and then goes back to the previous level. There could be a decaying change in the level, so it goes up and then starts again going down. There could be a sudden change in the direction, that means that right after intervention it changes, or it could be a delayed change in the direction, or it could be a ramp, that means that there is a change of direction and then going down again. So, in the statistics, we have two tools or two functions that combination of these two allows us to model any kind of nonlinear pattern. One, they call it a step function and the other one, they call it pulse function. So um, one is uh, zero prior to a time points and then after that is one or it's just uh, after time t and the other one is one only at time t and zero otherwise. We can combine these two together and create a regression type here that could actually handle all those kinds of uh, um, patterns of the data that I showed you. So um, yt, which is the outcome, is a rational, is a function of wb, b to the power b, b, uh, small b is the delay, is the lag delay, and b is uh, the back sheet operator in the time series divided by vb. I mean that if we want to expand it, it would be like a kind of quite a complicated uh, equation. And theta b divided by phi b a t, that's model the time series part and uh, omega or w b divided by v b models the impact or the shape of the intervention. So x t here is the intervention that's uh, zero prior time t and one after time t. 
One example is this one, which is a simple rational function. So practically what we are saying here is that um, the pattern of the outcome before intervention is linear. Therefore, it's beta zero plus beta one time. So this is the model for the outcome before intervention. But after intervention, the change or the pattern is a kind of nonlinear, and that nonlinear can be modeled with a simple, um, in fact, a rational function. If we expand this rational function, it will be a polynomial of degree infinity of uh, delta. But with this type of rational function, it's only, I mean, that one variable that we can, um, we can estimate it and uh, get the pattern of the data. So for those who are interested, um, fitting this kind of data is very simple. Um, I mean that by using this input equal to bracket time divided by bracket one, it, which is uh, intervention variable zero before time t and one after time t, we can fit that kind of model. And this is what we did uh, with, um, in fact, uh, <clears throat> With the testing rate in the province of Ontario, if you look at the plot on the top, this plot is linear um, prior to the intervention time, which was May 2012, and then it's a kind of nonlinear after that. And the, the, the symbols, the square and the, in fact, triangle symbols, these are the observed data, and the gray and the black lines are the, in fact, fitted model, fitted regression lines, and the confidence intervals are, are the gray. So we see that this rational function uh, really fitting the data fairly well for, uh, all three age groups that we looked at. Um, for these outcomes for the May, it wasn't kind of nonlinear, therefore a simple segmented regression that fitted a regression line before and a regression line after fitted this data fairly well. Now, <laughs> I can skip this anti-smoking. This is another paper that was published and we looked at the impact of anti-smoking on, on some health outcomes like AMI, angina, and stroke. And also we looked at uh, asthma, COPD, and bronchitis. And again, um, I'll show you that these are the real shape and the data, and that's what we see for the pattern of the angina that prior to the smoking ban was fairly flat, but after the smoking ban has a nonlinear pattern. These are uh, several outcomes, AMI, angina, stroke, asthma, COPD, and pneumonia, um, pre-ban, public access, workplaces, then restaurant and complete ban in the province of Ontario. We see that there are different shapes. And uh, so we showed that the smoking ban had a significant impact on uh, these outcomes. So we use, um, so the other thing that we have to be careful sometimes is that we are looking at uh, control groups, one control group could be another setting. Here we used another uh, city that there was no smoking ban as a control city with the same outcomes. And the other one is that sometimes there is no control city or control place, but we can use a control conditions. So here we show you that in the lower graph, we use, I think we use, um, in fact, appendicitis, um, that had nothing to do with, uh, um, in fact, smoking ban. 
and uh, in three different settings, Toronto, Durham, Thunder Bay. Durham and Thunder Bay, they were our control cities and Toronto was our target cities. And we showed that uh, if there is a change, it's not because something in the healthcare system happened or something else. Um, I very quickly show you this one. We used the interrupted time series for a case study. There was only one single participant that we had the pre and the post intervention measures for one single participant as a case study. And the outcome was related to the sleep and the mood dis uh, disturbance. So you see, I show you these graphs. So these graphs is, um, for example, the, the outcome was uh, sleep quality and the, the, the data points is the measurement for, for the single, in fact, cases that we had and we fitted the segmented regression in order to demonstrate that changes that has happened at different, in fact, um, intervals and each interval was related to uh, a period that uh, intervention was in fact uh, implemented and similar here. Um, what happened is that up to now we, don't, we talk about a single series. Now what happens if you have more than one observation? So uh, you have now you have individual level data and you are interested to, to measure to see what's happening. This was one study that uh, we looked at the impact of the change of the government policy in the, uh, in fact, uh, um, mental health, in fact, visits in the province. And uh, <clears throat> this is another example that um, I like to highlight it and show you the outcomes. This is an ongoing study that hasn't been completed yet. The preliminary result is submitted for the publication, so we are hoping to hear fairly soon. So what we did, we are looking at the all women between um, that they are between zero and 12 months postpartum in Ontario. And we were interested to see uh, what was the impact of the COVID on the rate for postpartum mental illness and addiction in the early months of the pandemic, March to June 2020, whether it differed uh, with the uh, before uh, COVID or not. So here, I didn't do fit a model or use interrupted time series. What I say, um, I got a message that it seems that I'm experiencing internet connection. It's okay um, on my end. Um, I'm not seeing any interruption. So what I did, I used two years data prior to the March 2020 and used month and um, uh, in fact the time, which was one, two, three, four, five, to predict the or to model the the rate of outcome, and then use this fitted model to predict the expected um, observations or expected utilization for March, April, May, and June. And then we overlay the observed values that we already had on these, uh, in fact, fitted models. So I use time as a predictor, the log of the number of women as the offset, we use a negative binomial regression because we are fitting a rate and then um, I modeled the, um, the correlation among the residuals using an AR1 and we use the um, SAS proglymix in order to fit the model and to the prediction. So I included the codes here, if somebody is interested can use it. So we fitted the model 
and then we use the predicted values and the 95% confidence intervals. And then we plotted the observed data before uh, March 2020 uh, with the fitted, uh, in fact, regression lines and the 95% confidence interval and the expected and the observed. So here we see that, for example, um, there was, um, for the outpatient visit, there was no difference in March, April, or May, but we see that there is an increase um, in June. And we did it for quite a large number of uh, different outcomes. And whether the test statistics is significant or not is fairly straightforward. It's, um, it's a z-test that we can see whether the difference between um, the expected and the observed with the um, standard, in fact, error of the expected um, for the denominator, we could just uh, fit a z-test and get the p-value that we have. And this is for another outcome, which is for the outpatient visit, significant increase in the number of visits after COVID that we see. And I can stop here and answer if there is any question. Okay, so first question. Uh, you have touched on the minimum data points for seasonality, and thank you for that. For trend analysis, wondering the minimum of how many data points are required. So for the trend, generally speaking, if we want to fit a regression line, then we need at least three time points. Therefore, so here we have to be careful between the variation and actually the estimates that we do. Obviously, if you have only three data points before and three data points after, we can fit a segmented regression. I mean that we can fit a regression line to the three data points and get the estimates and uh, before and after. But um, with the three data points, the reliability of the estimated parameters may not be really high, especially if there is a large variation um, between the observation before and possibly between the observation after. Uh, I have seen that people recommend like at least five data points, five to six data points at least. Uh, smaller than that, your findings may not be really reliable. And obviously, again, when you have only three data points, if the pattern is nonlinear, we can see it, but possibly with more than three data points, we can see whether uh, a linear relationship makes sense or not. Okay, thank you. Um, next question. Can you elaborate more on predicted versus expected numbers and rates after the change? <laughs> yeah, so what happened is, uh, we see that there is a process that's generating the data. And first of all, there is a test in a statistics, they call it Chow test. We can apply the Chow test to see whether there is a significant change in the mechanism of the data or not. Um, and then if there is, at what time points the the process, there is a break point in the process. Therefore, that means that we have to fit two different models. So here, what I did, I said that the only predictors that I have is uh, like month that takes care of the seasonality and also time that takes care of a possible trend if there is in the data. And I use, uh, I think I use two years data or three years data um let me go back see what i did i think i use uh, about three years data to to fit the model to get the model that's fitting the data and said that okay now that i'm here 
I have the denominator because I have the number of people at risk from March up to June. Therefore, with this number of people at risk and with these estimated parameters, what would be the expected number for month uh, April, May, and June? That would be the expected with the confidence interval. But at the same time, because I have access to ICS data and ICS is collecting, um, in fact, updating these, uh, these data regularly, I have the actual number, I mean, the, the true number of, uh, let's say, outpatient visit. And then when I overlay the observed on the, in fact, predicted, I can see whether the observed is within the 95% confidence interval or outside. If it's outside, there is a significant change. That means that the observed is not following the pattern of the same process prior to uh, March 2020. Uh, therefore, it should be because of the, the intervention. Okay, thank you. You've mentioned seasonality, but I'll just ask this question again in case there's any nuances that were missed. How is seasonality and autocorrelation related? Is it fair to say that autocorrelation can be explained by seasonality? No, no. Uh, obviously, autocorrelation, depending on the nature of that correlation, if it's positive or negative, if it's positive, that means that the observations are somehow similar. If it's negative, that means that they are fluctuating in different directions. Um, if the data has seasonality, then there will be a very strong correlation in your data and that's because of the seasonality or if there is a trend. I mean that any, any uh, deterministic component in your data is going to cause a very strong correlation. However, even after adjusting or removing these deterministic components, like trend and seasonality, still there is a there is an odd correlation, and that would be because of the nature of the, in fact, uh, the time series. Uh, it may not be just affected by by the month or by the season. Uh, it could be some other factors that that makes the the closer observations more similar compared to more distant observations. Uh, therefore, you have to make sure that you are adjusting for the possible seasonality, you are adjusting for the possible trend, and also you are adjusting for the odd correlation. And it's, it's fairly simple and straightforward how you adjust for that. Okay, thank you. Um, how do these methods contrast to current longitudinal analysis used in RCTs, i.e. the usual Cox regression or repeated measures, ANOVA, et cetera? Uh, there is a difference, and the difference is that in the classical regression, like in the COX or um, like analysis of variance, multivariate or univariate, and so on, there is one assumption, and that assumption is that the voice, the observations are independent. And if the observations are dependent, then analysis of variance won't work because you are violating um, that condition that uh, they are dependent. Um, some of these correlations can be adjusted for through, for example, if a survival analysis, um, you may try to, to use like random effect models or even in the regression, you are doing like, uh, in fact, repeated measure analysis of variance, these sort of things to random effect or through GEE, you can take care of some of these correlations. Um, however, as I said, there is a difference between uh, the time series and the classical regression. In time series, at any given time point, you have one observation, generally, if you are looking at the time series. Um, but when you are using like analysis of variance, Cox, and so on, you have repeated measure. You have more than one, in fact, measurement at any given time points when you do the longitudinal analysis. There are some similarity between these two. As I showed you here for uh, 
modeling and assessing the impact of the, I mean, that the COVID are used practically uh, longitudinal analysis. And uh, I, I took care of the, the serial correlation by modeling the residuals as AR1. And uh, also, um, if there are some other, uh, like, in fact, clustering, uh, some other uh, design component, they can be also adjusted through, uh, through random effect. Therefore, there are some overlaps between what we do with the time series and the longitudinal data analysis. Great, thank you. Um, next one, in Glimix, you have many options for choosing the structure of the errors. What is your process for selecting the error structure and how often is it sequential inferentially? So, I mean, that generally speaking, this is what I heard from my supervisor and I believe he's absolutely right. Um, if you take care of seasonality and uh, take care of trend, then you end up with a kind of a stochastic process. And AR2, um, a reasonably well fits the data. Uh, we published a paper many years ago and we looked at uh, more than 52 health outcomes in the province of Ontario. And I showed that a simple model could actually predict all of these outcomes, um, seasonal, non-seasonal, with trend, without trend, and so on. And uh, hardly you need, um, if, you, if you properly account for the uh, seasonality and the cycle in your data, uh, you generally, you are okay with fitting an AR2 model. And in the paper that I published for the, um, in fact, uh, R square auto rate, um, I showed that um, if you use AR2, uh, this is good enough to take care of the serial correlation and your parameter estimates would be reasonably correct. A majority of the softwares, they have an option. You can use like, uh, um, sometimes you can use um, AIC, BIC to compare uh, different models with different covariance structures, see which one has a better goodness of fit. If you are using SAS, Prod, AutoRay could actually help you uh, to do the model selection for the residuals, which is the order of the residuals. And uh, so there are some uh, automated options in the software that can help you to identify the model. Great, thank you very much uh, for our next presentation. Again, Dr. Molinidin. Um, several people are saying thank you very much for an excellent presentation, such valuable information, very much appreciated. Um, we've had a few inquiries just about your slide deck and whether you're able to share that with people independently and, and also uh, the best way to reach you if they'd like to contact you afterwards. So maybe you'd just like to say a few words about that. Well, the best way to reach me is my email, which is my first name dot last name at utronto.ca. That would be the best way of reaching me. Uh, I'll be happy to share the presentations. However, the, the, the two last plots, um, those are still under review. So please do not use or distribute these plots. The rest, they are fine. And uh, hopefully when the paper is published also, um, they can be used by the public and that's fine. And uh, so I'll be happy to, to share the presentations. Um, if you want to contact me, just use my email and send me an email. I'll be again, happy many to thank yous this. coming through uh, to the GoToWebinar system to thank you again, Dr. Rahim. So uh, really, really appreciate your time. And uh, we'll be in touch just in terms of a follow-up to our recording for posting as well. My pleasure. And thank you for inviting me, giving me the opportunity to share some of my experiences uh, with our colleagues that they may find some of these techniques useful. Yeah, and, and thank you.
Much appreciated. Thanks everyone for attending and we'll be in touch soon. Bye for now. Thank you. Thanks, bye.